Welcome once again to Sahara TV. My name is Kwesi Eson Bakun. In, in fulfillment of Article 67 of the Constitution of Ghana, President John Dramani Mahama appeared before Parliament to read out or to um, submit his, his State of the Nation address to the legislators. Some in his party have said that the address was full of hope and that it was also refreshing. On the other side, however, some in the opposition New Patriotic Party have said it's only a refurbished version of last week, last year's address. On the line joining me to dissect the President's State of the Nation address is Dr. John Osei Kwapong. Dr. Osei Kwapong is the Director of Research and Planning Division of Student Affairs at Columbia University. He's also, the, he's also an adjunct lecturer at the School of Public Affairs and Administration at the Metropolitan College of New York. You all come to Sara TV, Dr. Kwapong. Thank you very much, Senior Kwesi. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate. Um, let me let me let, let's start off with this. Was was the address satisfactory at all? Did you find it satisfactory? Did it merit a state of the nation address? You know, it's uh, you know satisfactory is, is 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 relative, right? But if you want to look at what the president try to do in the state of the nation's address uh, you go from you know you can only engage someone um, on the terrain on which they promised uh, they were going to deliver on so that you can actually look at what was said or what was not said mm. uh, i didn't listen to the address live itself uh, but i've read the the text of the address yeah. Um, he started off by saying that there were four pillars that he's promised his administration is going to be based on, uh, putting people first, uh, building a strong, uh, building a strong economy, um, economic transformation, um, and then transparent and accountable governance. Yep. Uh, and along those four pillars, he tried to highlight a number of things that um, his his administration is trying to do in fulfillment of those. Uh, promised uh, pillars. There were a lot of questions um, left unanswered by the different programs that he highlighted or did not highlight. Um, there were a lot of sort of unanswered questions in terms of everything sounded more like in the future, we will do X, we will do Y, and mm. I've directed X and I've directed Y. Uh, but in a, in, a, in, a, in a typical state of the nation address, um, you're looking to see the president one give you some reassurance that um, his or her administration is actively engaged, trying to do the job for which they were elected um, into office. And that is why I can understand all the litany of things that the president was trying to say either they are doing or will be doing under each of those um, each of those four mm. pillars. Is, is that uh, but overall, we do know the reality on the ground. I mean, you talk to the folks in Ghana, they know the reality on the ground. Um, and so... Again, a lot of the things he highlighted leaves a lot of questions to uh, still to be answered. Did, did he, uh, did he uh, touch on everything that you expected him to touch on, though? Is there anything that he left out? Is there anything that you expected should necessarily be in any State of the Nation address that he did not touch on? You know, the, the, I think the, the, the pillar under putting people first seems to be the area under which he at least tried to provide a lot of details, everything around the LEAP program, things around education, things around um, health, things around teacher training, uh, building new schools, challenges of higher education, et cetera, et cetera. I was a little bit surprised that the pillar under transforming the economy um, dealt a lot more with a historical lesson on the structure of the Ghanaian economy, what we need to do to change the nature of that economy. Uh, but I don't think he dwelt enough on the, on the current economic challenges, the measures that have been put in place, and whether they are beginning to see some initial indications as to whether those um, economic, quote unquote, solutions that they are trying to put in place would work. So for me, the, 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 the section under uh, um, the pillar transforming the economy particularly as it dealt with the current economic situation and what is actually being done to arrest uh, some of those challenges, I found a little bit short 
on a lot of details and specifics. Mm. Okay. Now, on, on people, he said that his government was concerned about bridging the gap between the richest and the poorest in the, in the society. Can you, do you see any um, policy, you know, policy initiatives in this area so far in his two-year term? I mean, in, his, in the two years of his four-year term so far? One of the biggest programs he highlighted was the uh, was the leap um, was the leap program, which is the livelihood empowerment uh, program. It's 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 a, it's a sort of a social welfare program in which cash transfer payments are made to uh, poor households. Yeah. Um, and so he seemed to have talked a lot about that and the about how about 74,000 um, households had received um, cash transfer payment. There was a very interesting um, Facebook discussion um, initiated by um, a friend of mine um, and a good mentor as well, Professor Kwesi Prempe, which therefore sort of forced me to go online to do some searches. And I found a, an evaluation of the program that was done in collaboration between a research center at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, um, and ISE Legon. I mean, the program is fraught with a, quite a number of um, challenges. Yeah. I mean, first of all, 74,000 households, if the percentage of people in poverty, as reported by the Ghana Statistical Service um, in their last um, uh, living standard survey is accurate, then 74,000 households um, doesn't come anywhere near the number of people or the number of households in poverty to sort of make a real impact, impact in yeah. terms of trying to bridge, mm. bridge the gap um, uh, between the, the, the rich and the poor. And there are quite a number of challenges that that evaluation report indicated that the LEAP program actually, uh, actually faces. Um, real quick, the president talked about how the LEAP program and the cash transfers actually allows people um, to uh, make some kinds of investment. But if you look at that evaluation report, the biggest chunk of where those cash um, transfers go to in terms of the household who receive it, they spend a majority of that on food, and then they spend the next highest category is health, the next category is education, and the next category um, is clothing, which mm. means that those cash transfer payments are not necessarily um, going into the kinds of investments that the president is hoping or maybe had said that um, households would make. But it's more they use it for primary consumption. Okay, let me ask let me ask you again though in connection with the same with the same subject. It, it, the the whole leap thing, how transparent is it? I, I, I know it was introduced by the NPP government and the NDC actually had issues with that, specifically in terms of you know corruption you know, transparency and all of that. How, how really transparent is the, is the LEAP uh, initiative? Do you know? Um, so going off on the evaluation report that I read, um, there was a separate evaluation that was done specifically on the operations of the program. Um, and it highlighted um, quite a number of issues that raises some concerns. So for instance, one of the things that the operations evaluation um, highlighted was the fact that uh, households who had been identified as eligible to receive some of these cash payments um, never received um, those cash payments. Hmm. Um, and so you are just hoping that these are not households who are on record as having received some of those um, cash payments. Hmm. Also, there are some conditions attached to uh, the receipt of some of these cash payments in which the response from the households who participated in the study indicated some lack of clarity or confusion about when payments end, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. There was a very interesting question that was asked as part of that evaluation, and which was, did you pay a bribe in order to influence your receiving of a cash um, of a cash transfer payment and the leap? And majority of the respondents, at least according to this study, said no. I think it was about 90-something percent said no, they didn't have to pay a bribe. Mm. Um, and then in that survey, I think there was about maybe 5% of the people um, who said yes. But the report is very comprehensive and highlights quite a number of things that must be done right. Okay. If LEAP will be able to do what it's supposed to do. Okay. Now, the, the president also drew attention to the 10% cut in his own salary and that of his cabinet. And I remember that at a point he was actually suggesting that 
um, Parliament also follow that example by, you know, uh, giving out 10% of their, of their remunerations for um, building new district hospitals and stuff like that. Are you impressed? Oh, not necessarily. I mean, 10% of... I mean, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice goodwill gesture. It's a very nice political move. Um, not to, um, not to uh, pour cold water over the president's um, goodwill gesture, but I just wonder what 10% of a salary cut would actually boil down to in terms of real transformation as to what that money is going to be put to. I mean, so if you take 10% from every executive, um, uh, you know, every cabinet member, you know, every minister, et cetera, et cetera, what is the total amount and how many schools or how many um, community health centers we would be able to get out mm. of? I mean, if the amount is substantial and you're going to get 10, 20 community health centers across all the 200 and something districts in Ghana, great. But without knowing what the total cumulative amount is going to be, and what exactly um, it would be able to accomplish in terms of some of these district health centers, then I think it's it's, it's a nice rhetoric um, whose impact I'm still not clear uh, about how positive it's going to be. Okay, all right. He also said on education that, uh, I quote, where education is concerned, we have a history of being visionary. Is this a fact? I mean, especially considering the fact that the NDC and the NPP can hardly make up their mind on how many years high school students should, should spend in school. The whole SS system seems to be in kind of a disarray. Is this a fact that we are actually visionary in, 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 in terms of education? I don't think, I, I don't think so. Um, we have some, you know, I think we do recognize the importance of education and the importance that education plays in the national life um, of the country and in our future. So I think we do, both parties do recognize that. Uh, if you look at both parties' manifestos, they do have a section in which they talk about the importance of education and the kinds of things they think they can do um, around education. Um, but if you look at the actual uh, policy actions, directed towards the education center, you still, yeah, one walks away, or at least I walk away with the impression that we are still struggling to figure out what the right policy answer is to um, our education or the vision of education or what we see should be the future of education in the country. So whether it's at the basic level, whether it's at the junior secondary or the senior secondary level, or whether it's even tertiary education, that um, we, there, there is still a struggle, which I believe a very um, we need a, a, a national dialogue around how we want education to look like mm. and make some very important policy moves for which we are really committed to to make sure that we can get the transformation we want in the education sector. Mm. I mean, over and over again, you hear them talk about education is important, education is important, uh, but for some reason you're not seeing the kinds of policy moves that would strengthen the education sector. But, and we, by education sector, we're talking about the public education sector. Yeah. Okay. Now, the part of his speech that most Ghanaians have been debating on since uh, the delivery of the address is uh, when he spoke about free education, free, that's free um, um, high school education. This was something that the NPP, the opposition NPP, had as the, the cornerstone of their, of their, of their um, campaign. You know, it was the mantra of their campaign, if you will. Now, yes. the NDC practically said it was not possible, or at best it was achievable in stages. That's like gradually. Now, the president comes to parliament and says he's actually going to offer Ghanaians free high school education. Um... Is, is, is that just a, you know, a, a regurgitated, you know, idea from the NPP? So, you know, the, 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 the announcement in the State of the Nation's address from the president, as you rightly acknowledge, has generated quite some heated debate. And if you even look at um, the debate on, uh, on social media, 
So you see one of two arguments. From the MPP side and from those who sympathize with the MPP, they see it as very dishonest, a stealing of an idea, etc., etc., that, you know, how can the president and his party, who were so vehemently opposed to free SHS, already now turn around and all of a sudden are embracing the idea. If you look at the other side of the argument, the, the NDC is trying to defend itself by saying, well, this is not an idea that the MPP has any sort of property rights to. It's, a, it's enshrined in the Constitution, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. What I say about that debate, and I've participated in that debate, yes, I do understand um, the, the frustration and the anger um, from the MPP, right, in the sense that an entire political campaign was staked partly on such a brilliant idea um, for which they were really castigated by the other side. And so to sit back and watch the party now do a flip-flop and embrace the idea is very annoying. Uh, if you also look at the timing of it, 2015-2016 academic year, um, the, the, the cynic in me says it is timed perfectly, and maybe this is, this is not what the president intends. But I'm saying that if I am you know, looking at it um, you know, you know, in a very sort of cynical way, I look at the timing and say, perhaps there's some eye towards the 2016 election for which they intend, therefore, to reap some uh, political Let me, let me quickly throw this in, because the NPP has also suggested that it's a move to, to, to uh, like, basically make them, you know, devoid of a campaign message in, in, in the next election. You think this is valid? This is legitimate? And... And, you know, there, there are all sorts of um, questions that this move is raising. For, for me, what I say, and one of the stories I keep telling on social media is that I met a young girl last year on the Cape Coast Accra Road who sells garlic. Um, you know, so for me, whether the president has flip-flopped or not, and whether who is going to reap the political rewards if they are able to do free SHS right or wrong, ultimately, for me, if it's, that, if it's going to help people like that young girl I met in the Central region last year, then I really do not care whose idea it was and who mm. stole from who. I yeah. understand the politics of it. And then back to your question, I don't think the NPP is now devoid of a campaign message, right? I mean, there's so much the NPP can stake its 2016 campaign on. Um, they can, you know, they can stay. You, you don't stake a campaign on a single policy idea or in a single uh, policy issue. Although that is important, you don't build an entire campaign around. Yeah. So I'm very sure that the MPP would actually have a message or something to run on in 2016. Okay. I mean, look. if the president does this and they don't do it very well, that even is another campaign message for them, which is we have this brilliant idea. The NDC has tried to implement it, and the initial signs don't look good which is why you need to bring us into office to actually to get actually this To actually implement it. Okay. Our, our yes. time is far spent, but um, I'll still try and push for a few more questions before we sure. finally um, get out of this seat. Um, co on corruption, he says, we will fight this battle on two fronts. Firstly, to put in place measures to prevent corruption. And secondly, to pursue and punish corruption wherever it occurs. Do you see this happening in, in, in the face of JIDA and all of that? Do you really so see the, the president in, making an effort to fight corruption? I mean, he did in his nation of in, in the state of the nation address. He does highlight a number of sort of moves that they are making um, in the area of fighting corruption, um, and then you know, sort of all of these assurances that they are really committed and they would fight corruption. But for me, that's that's generally where it tends to it tends to end. Um, that. Um, there's a lot of we will do X, Y, and Z. Um, you see some prosecution being done now with, I think, one or two of the JIDA officials. But otherwise, uh, it's still, for me, a lot of rhetoric um, when it comes to um, the fight against, the fight against um, corruption. Okay. Finally, on foreign policy, he also, you know, he spoke about Ghana's role in the Malian crisis, something for which um, he received a bit of... I mean, Ghana actually received a threat from some uh, Islamist militants, not that we've heard too much about that since. And then he also spoke about um, the establishment of a, of a diasporan bureau, and then went on to talk about 
regional integration. Re regional integration, for, for instance, has always been on every president's uh, state of the, of the nation address, if I'm right. But it seems to be just mere talk. What is different this time? I don't think anything is necessarily different. Um, I think deep down over the years across different political parties, across different types of political regimes, we've always been talking about this need for regional integration. Um, there are several sort of economic, social, political challenges, some way, somehow, that prevents that regional integration from really, really taking a strong foothold and actually playing out. But again, um, they are going to keep trying, um, and hopefully maybe someday something positive would come out um, of it. But I think it's it's part of the continued trajectory of we really want to see regional integration happen. Um, as to whether they have, as to whether it's going to happen, that's a different story. Okay. Dr. John Osayokwapon, thank you so much for your time. There's so much more I would have loved to touch on with you, agriculture, housing, you know, the, the whole lot. But definitely, yes. we'd we'll like to invite you into the studio the next time so we can have a more yes. comprehensive chat about some of these things. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so Always much for your time. Always a pleasure to talk to you. You're welcome. Thank you. That's, yeah. That has been Dr. John Osekwapon, Director of Student Affairs, Research and Planning at the Columbia University, speaking on the President of Ghana's State of the Nation Address. Please remember to follow us on live stream Sahara TV. Look for us on live stream Sahara TV. And stay tuned. There's more to come.